welcome everybody to our uh, uh, this this installment of the peace and relationships series. Uh, my name is Shirin Kosropur. I'm director of the Center for Peace and Conflict Studies. I invite you to um, follow the link that Leila will put in the chat box and see all of our events, including some of the past events. Um, where there are recordings, you may find them interesting. We have this series and we have another series, Cinema of Conflict and Transformation. Um, we have in both of the series, we have, I think, one more installment uh, coming up this semester. So if you can join us live, that is the best way uh, we can interact with you and you can ask and participate in the discussion, ask questions and make comments. But um, you can always use the videos as well. Um, we also have ACC has a degree program in peace and conflict studies. You can find that under interdisciplinary studies, peace and conflict studies. And um, I'll ask Leila to put a link to that as well. Um, if you have questions about that degree program, you want to consider it as a um, pathway to get your undergraduate, um, like the transfer courses um, out of the way at ACC and transfer to a four-year university. Um, uh, with any questions, you can contact me or you can contact um, Dr. Sarah Bowman, who has joined us today, and she's the coordinator for the degree program in Peace and Conflict Studies. Um, so, um, we do ask you that if you're comfortable and in a position where you can turn on your video, please do so, so we can see your lovely faces um, as Duena speaks. Um, and uh, she will tell you herself how she prefers to um, take questions and comments during her presentation. She um, is a pro at this. She's been doing this with us for a long time. And um, in addition to that, she's a former colleague. She taught at ACC with us um, for a long time, and that's how I had the pleasure to meet her. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Duena Welch and ask her to introduce herself and say a few words about herself. And um, I'll be quiet now. Thanks very much, Dr. Kostarapur. Uh, first of all, I want to start off by saying, uh, if you've seen any of the other webinars that I've done, and I think there are now seven, this might be the seventh. Um, I normally don't sound like I've got a frog in my throat, but I'm getting over a cold. So I hope you can bear with me. Um, so I taught at ACC for, I think seven or eight years. I'm never quite sure how many years it was, but uh, I did get to know Dr. Coast Rapport and many, many students and faculty at ACC then. And it was a wonderful time in my life. I relocated to Eugene, Oregon seven years ago uh, in 2015. And uh, this is where I make my home now. And I write books, I teach about, I lecture about, um, I see clients about one subject now these days, and that is relationship science, how to have happier, healthier relationships, how to find and be the right partner, how to attain a healthy relationship and keep a healthy relationship, all based on what we know through social science. And uh, I have a book series called Love Factually. And in fact, um, my most recent book is Love Factually, 10 Proven Steps for My Wish to I Do, revised and updated, because even though the first book, nothing about it is wrong in the last seven years, there's a lot more that we know now, and there's a lot more nuance to this new edition. Like I like to say, uh, date, human nature didn't change, but dating did. So here's the cover to the new edition. It's got a handy little uh, magnifying glass here around a heart showing that we will be looking into the heart of love using fact rather than opinion as the guide. So um, all that said, I got into this because of a personal interest. I had had my heart pretty badly broken and I wanted to um, avoid heartbreak in the future and the cultural um, and friendly advice and family advice I was getting was not very helpful. So I wondered whether science had anything to say about healthy relationships and peaceful relationships and passionate relationships. And it does. So that's what I've been sharing now for a lecture series that is now seven lectures long. And today's lecture is, um, or today's webinar, it's not going to be a lecture, it's a webinar so that you can interact with me, is going to be about grief. I already did one 
uh, about grief, but this one's going to have a completely different take on it. So if you, if you want to know about how to recover from a broken heart, that is my first grief webinar that I did for ACC. Today's grief webinar is more about um, how to deal with betrayal and its aftermath. So I'd like to let you know that I like to take questions on the fly. As you have a question, please put it in the chat and I'll see it and I'll respond to it directly at that moment. That's not um, distracting to me usually. And if it is, you can remind me of where I was when I got distracted. So I need to share my screen. Is there a good way to do that? Is, have, am I uh, enabled to do that? I'm gonna put share screen here. There we go, I think I can. Oh, look, there I can. Here we go. All right, so betrayal and its aftermath. Uh, the first thing I'd like to say is that um, one of the reasons I'm talking about grief in tandem with betrayal is because grief is a natural outcome of discovering that the way that we expected someone to behave, they didn't behave in that way. This is more than just a transgression. Betrayal goes beyond just a mismatch between expectations of how someone would behave and how they actually did. The, the behavior that is unexpected is so very out of line with what we needed that we experience it as um, a real emotional breach. And it's difficult for us to continue a relationship with that person because we think the nature of the entire relationship has been altered by whatever this behavior is. And of course, a really common example is um, sexual infidelity in a relationship. But there are many, many other examples of betrayal that we can cover as we go along. And when it's a romantic relationship, and of course, that's how I'm gonna couch this because that's what I do, but you can really map this onto almost any kind of betrayal. One of the questions that we face is whether we should um, stay or go whether we're going to, going to remain in this relationship, or whether we're going to leave it. And either way, there's a loss. There's a loss of the kind of relationship we thought we were in with this person. Um, again, whether we stay or we go. So when I talk about grief, I'm gonna talk about both how to deal with your grief if you leave and the aspects of grief that are constant, whether you leave or whether you don't, and uh, how to move through that. And then finally, we will all know people who need us to step in and help them deal with this kind of loss, the, what I call unacknowledged loss. And we'll talk more about what those unacknowledged losses are at that point um, in the webinar today. So starting with the nature of betrayal, I've already covered what betrayal is. It's not just a mismatch between our expectations and what someone we're close to did. It's such a, a breach that the foundation of our relationship feels as if it's been shaken. Um, I'm gonna take a little sip of water here and ask you to just take a moment to think about whether betrayal, I've already answered the question, whether betrayal is common. It's extremely common in intimate relationships. In fact, Tim Cole and Emily Duddleston in uh, their book, Broken Trust, Overcoming Intimate Betrayal and Reclaiming Your Life, which is a book I highly recommend for anyone struggling with betrayal in their romantic relationships. Um, I in fact was uh, an endorser and reviewer for this book. My endorsement's on the back of it. I don't get any kickbacks from that. I just really believe in the book. It's, it's science-based, which is very uh, much unlike most advice books. This one's science-based, but uh, Dr. Cole points out that betrayal is so on, uh, um, often experienced that you should really expect it in a relationship of any length. You should expect that at some point, someone in the relationship is going to do something that makes you question uh, whether you're gonna stay or not. And that this is because of the paradox of intimacy, the paradox of my life is much better because I accept an intimate relationship. And the paradox is that in order to improve my life through accepting an intimate relationship, I also have to give up 
some of the things I would do otherwise if I weren't in an intimate relationship. I have to do things differently than I would ordinarily do them. And that tension between self and what's best for the relationship means that occasionally people will, not often, but occasionally people will um, act out of line with what is expected. The good news is that most betrayal can be overcome. There's another book I often recommend um, called Not Just Friends. It's by Dr. Shirley Glass. And she talks about intimate betrayal just in the context of affairs, sexual infidelity, emotional infidelity. Where the form betrayal takes is, I expected you to have me first and foremost in your life as your, and solely in your life as your romantic and sexual partner and you did something else. And now that's causing me to question the foundation of our relationship. And she found that two thirds of these kinds of betrayals not only does the couple unit um, survive, but they actually say they're closer than before. So most betrayal, even the kind of betrayal that we think perhaps would be the least easy to overcome, it can be overcome. Um, in line with the entire discussion of betrayal is the idea that by uh, Dr. John Gottman and Dr. Julie Schwartz Gottman, which if you follow relationship science at all, you'll know that they are kind of platinum standard relationship scientists. They point out in um, their more recent work, um, Eight Dates is a, re a recent book of theirs that I re really recommend everyone get who is in a coupleship or considering it. There's really not any way to be intimate without having conflict. So betrayal, the, the summary here is betrayal is ordinary, it's painful, Usually you can overcome it though. And at some level, the reason betrayal happens is because uh, this is something I haven't said yet. The reason betrayal happens is that um, people hide things from each other, usually not because they want to hurt them, but because they don't want to hurt them. They realize they're going to do something that their partner isn't going to like, or their friend or their family member, whoever it is they're betraying, isn't going to like. They have their own reasons for doing whatever this is. And they hide the nature of it because they want to avoid conflict. And what I want to point out to you is if you're going to make it through a betrayal, you're going to have to have conflict. If you're going to have a genuinely intimate relationship, whether or not it has betrayal involved, you're going to have conflict. And that you can't genuinely have intimacy. And by intimacy, I don't mean sexual intimacy necessarily. I mean a genuine knowing of each, each other that is complete and without barriers, without having some degree of conflict. And that's because no two people are exactly alike and our needs are not perfectly aligned. And therefore there are going to be differences and those differences will have to be at a minimum discussed, even if the ultimate agreement is to live with um, these differences and the differences just are what they are. There's going to be conflict. Um, yet another scientist, uh, Dr. Terry Orbuck, who's done uh, the early years of marriage project, which has now been going on for more than 25 years. So not so many early years now, these are the same couples followed for 25 years. We know that over those years, following hundreds and hundreds of couples, there were only seven who said they never had conflict and all seven of them broke apart. You have to have conflict for your relationship to survive. Lena? Yes? I don't know if you're keeping your eye on the people who raised their hands, um, but oh, you know what? I can't. I can't see. Yeah. So I'll let you know chat right now. Layla has her hand up. Oh, okay. Hang on. Let me look at. Let me look at chat more. It's not showing it to me. Oh, here's the chat. Got it. Yeah, I just wanted to direct your attention to the chat in case you weren't looking at it. Um, okay. Uh, could so Evie. Evie, is that, am I saying that correct, Evie, correctly? Uh, could this example possibly fit into a relationship with a partner who has an abusive relationship with alcohol, feeling betrayed in that sense? So um, I'm glad you asked that. In general, there are, and we are gonna cover this a little bit later on, but there are three A's where relationships usually are better off parting ways. And I wanna point out that these behaviors have to be chronic in order for it to be 
a betrayal where usually a betrayal where people think, okay, am I going to stay or go? Um, and where people are usually better off actually going. One of these is addiction. Um, the quality of a relationship doesn't necessarily, people who have an addiction need help, but if they don't get it, their partner can't force them to get it. And so usually uh, relationships, the, usually the partner who has been betrayed this way uh, finds that his or her life is enhanced by leaving if the addiction is chronic. In other words, if the person doesn't get help, doesn't stay with uh, a program of sobriety, doesn't um, make sustained effort to change. The other two A's are uh, adultery, um, sexual infidelity. Uh, some people you know, have an open relationship, but the research shows that people with an open relationship tend to close those borders again fairly quickly, or they tend to break apart. And if uh, both people aren't on the same page that an open relationship is what they want, or if one person is actually lying about it, and this is a, a repeated pattern, usually the relationship uh, partner who's betrayed feels better leaving that relationship than sticking with it. And then finally, um, there's abuse. If somebody's abusing either persons or substances, uh, then that relationship is, again, sometimes people get help for that, but the only longitudinal study of abuse and, and um, their abusers and their partners that's ever been done was done by um, Neil Jacobson and John Gottman uh, a couple decades ago. And they found that uh, only one abuser in their entire sample ever stopped physically abusing their partner. None of them emotionally stopped abusing their partner. And the one person uh, who physically stopped only stopped because they realized that abuse is always wrong. So um, the good news is most people who are in abusive relationships actually do leave. Usually the abusee does leave. But um, yes, those are betrayals. And I have to say, normally the, the decision that ultimately is made is to go in those circumstances. So that kind of answers our first question, is love enough? Most of the time in our culture, people engage in intimate partnerships because they love. They aren't usually forced into them. It's not normally arranged in the United States. So, um, and interestingly enough, most people who are currently getting divorced, are, they still feel love for their partner. So love is clearly not enough. If the justification for staying after betrayal is, but I love them, you're gonna need more than that. So love is just one. Now, if you don't love them, the question of whether to stay or go, a lot of people just won't stay. There's just not enough motivation to stay. Even if all the other answers are in line with um, an answer of, yeah, it probably makes sense. A lot of people won't stay if they don't feel love. Love is what's called necessary, but not really sufficient. So um, love isn't enough by itself though. And I'm deriving these questions from um, a variety of sources, but mainly from the book Broken Trust by Dr. Tim Cole and Emily Donaldson. Uh, is your partner skilled or motivated enough for the betrayal not to recur? Some people just don't have the skills. They're, um, they don't have the social intelligence. They're not able to learn it or they're not motivated. They don't care enough. You know, betrayal occurs because there was a behavior that was so motivating that this person engaged in that behavior despite the knowledge that it was going to really hurt the foundation of the relationship if it were discovered. So they had a strong motivation to engage in the behavior. And you have to ask yourself, is this person motivated enough for the betrayal not to recur? Again, this isn't just infidelity. This could be a lot of things. Uh, Cole and Donaldson come up with examples such as um, one partner believes that every that they are very solid and every decision they're making together is a decision made together. And the other partner has been looking for jobs on the other side of the country without notifying uh, their partner. That's a big betrayal. That's a big breach in hey, I thought our relationship was fully committed and you don't. So 
got to ask ourselves in these situations, is our partner motivated enough not to do this again? And one of the ways you're going to know that is their sustained pattern of um, actions, not words. Anyone can say, I won't do it again. But um, it, and if action, if the person says the words, I won't do it again, and their actions support that, then great. But anytime actions and words are misaligned, you should believe the actions, not the words. And you need to believe them over time. Normally betrayals take a while to occur. Yeah, there are the occasional, you know, I just got a wild hair at a one night stand. It'll never happen again. And you just look over time to see whether that's true. But most of the time, intimate betrayals occur over an extended period of time. So that's another question. Is this a pattern or is it a one-off? With the three A's, addiction, adultery, abuse. Did this behavior happen one time, in which case it's still a huge breach and a lot of people would ask whether they should stay or go. And there's still a lot of work to do to recover if you decide you want to. But a one-off is much, much easier to recover from than a pattern. And most people won't stay when there's um, a pattern. They won't find it worthwhile. So that's a question to ask yourself. Another question is, um, do you feel worse about yourself or your identity as a result of if you stayed or would you, or if you have stayed, do you? Anytime, um, this is something Dr. Cole makes a point of, anytime somebody stays and they, it actually causes them to think differently and worse about themselves and their value um, as a human being, that's probably a situation where it doesn't make a lot of sense to remain in the relationship. You may need to separate and it may ultimately result in, um, in a breakup. But he points out that studies show that people who were starting to feel worse about themselves as human beings, as a result of staying in a relationship with ongoing betrayal, they usually feel better having left than, have, than, if, than the people who felt that way and stayed. One of the things I really like about Dr. Cole's work is that he examines whether to even try to recover from intimate betrayal. These are questions that are um, addressed in that book. Okay, another question. Does the, the person who is, has done the betrayal, oh, somebody says, can you both be both the victim and the abuser in a committed relationship. Hmm. The only research that I know that's, that's longitudinal to this date is the research I have uh, pointed to by Gottman, by Neil Jacobson and John Gottman. Uh, Neil Jacobson has since passed away. And what they find, and there's also another excellent book um, written by a personal protection expert called The Gift of Fear. It's got by a man named Gavin De Becker. And his, his work is not based on research. It's based on a lot of experience, but research supports it. There's yet another book called Why Does He Do That? Inside the Minds of Angry and Controlling Men, which is a book by Lundy Bancroft, um, which is a guy. It sounds like a woman, but that's a guy. Um, they point out that when women have been abused, they are very likely to be in relationships in the future where they become abused again. So if a woman was raised witnessing her mother be abused or being abused herself, she's likely to enter into relationships where she is the abusee. Um, it's not because there's some flaw inherent in her. Uh, part of that is abusers look for people who don't have a pattern of knowing what it's like not to be abused. Abusers pick their victims based on certain profiles. And one of those profiles is that this person has been abused formerly. So um, when a woman has been abused or witnessed abuse growing up, she usually becomes the abusee. When a man 
has, and notice I said usually, it's not always, we're talking about patterns here. When a man has witnessed abuse or been abused as a child, uh, he tends to become an abuser. In other words, Everyone in this scenario has been a victim. It's unusual for people who haven't been victims to either be abusees or abusers. But at the time that abuse is happening, there's an abuser and an abusee. The abuser is not also a victim in that case. They frequently claim that they are, but studies of police records show that this is not the case. Studies show that the abuser, when the police are called and they usually aren't called, but when the police are called, the abuser will claim that they were abused. No, what happened in that scenario is the abuser was met with some resistance and the abuser claims that the resistance is abuse. It's not, it's self-defense. Um, so another question is, does the betrayer feel remorse? Um, so for example, one of the, Here, here's a profile of a betrayer who probably isn't going to do it again. Let's say that you're involved with someone who had an affair, but the affair lasted a very short period of time. It happened after the first few years of your relationship together, not during the honeymoon phase, in other words, not during the courtship. Um, the person does not have a history of affairs with anyone else. In other words, it wasn't part of their past that they had a, an affair when they were involved with other people before. So they don't have history. The affair they had was very short. It didn't happen early in your relationship. They told you, rather than you finding them out, they confessed they, that they had uh, an extra relationship pairing. And um, they felt remorse. They felt terrible about it. This is a scenario where it makes a lot of sense to work through this betrayal and, and recover this relationship. On the other hand, if this person has cheated on other people they've been involved with, if this person has uh, no remorse, this is just what they're doing. If this person didn't confess, you caught them. And that's the only reason they're stopping is they got caught. If this person continues having the affair after you caught them, if uh, the affair went on for a really long time, these are cases where it's, it makes less sense to do the intense work that it's going to be required to recover from um, that kind of betrayal. So you need to ask yourself, is this betrayer feeling the weight of what they have done? They feel terrible about having done it and they don't want to do it again. And they, in fact, enlist you to help them stop. They admit that they are in the middle of doing something that doesn't work for you. If they confess, instead of you catching them, then that's, that's more toward the stay and work it out side of things. Another question is, does your partner, and this goes back to Tim Cole's idea about, does your partner have the skills to not continue betraying you? Because none of us needs a pattern of ongoing betrayal. That's not going to work. If, if that's what's going to happen, it's not gonna work out. So is your partner able to care about other people's feelings, needs, and safety? Sociopaths, people with, with sociopathology, people with pathological personalities, they, don't have the ability to take into account what is good for other people and actually care about it. There are pe people who are sadistic who, in fact, they know how their actions are gonna affect you and they enjoy your pain. If this person either can't detect other people's feelings or they detect them and they just don't care, if they don't understand other human beings' needs or they understand them and they just don't care, or even worse, they enjoy your suffering, if they can't keep you safe, or even worse, they want to violate your safety, this is never gonna work. This, is, this maps onto the dark triad of Machiavellianism, narc pathological narcissism, um, 
there's one one more that I'm blanking out on. Let me look at my notes here. Normally don't look at my notes. Because mm. I want to name them all. Oh, come on, papers separate. I know you love each other, but let's get apart now. Oh, um, pathological narcissism, Machiavellian personality, and psychopathic personality. Um, Cole also names borderline personality disorder. Now, I, I wanted you to, yeah, sociopath sociopathy, uh, that's, um, that's a psychopathic personality. If if somebody's diagnosed with borderline personality, look, I'm not saying that people with these personality disorders are, especially borderline, are necessarily bad people. People with borderline personality disorder basically ha have an ex extreme form of an attachment disorder. They, they're terrified of abandonment and consequently they do a lot of things that hurt people they're close to, friends, family, intimate partners, siblings. Um, kind of in order to, to ironically push people away so that they can't get hurt by abandonment. And those behaviors tend to result in abandonment. Um, it used to be considered that borderline personality disorder, like other personality disorders, was uncur incurable. It, to, my, to my knowledge, and, and to, in fact, there was an argument in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the DSM, which is what psychiatrists and psychologists and MDs used to diagnose uh, all the different psych disorders. There was an argument whether personality disorders ought to even be in there because they're completely incurable. And the idea in the DSM is that we want to treat things that are curable. And uh, I will tell you that to my knowledge, it is still true that uh, pathological narcissism, any kind of psych psychopathic personality, Machiavellian personality, these aren't curable, people don't change but borderline is different. So if you've been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, there's now a treatment for that. It's called dialectical behavioral therapy, DBT. And I encourage you to seek it out so that, so that your relationships can thrive, so that you can um, have healthy, thriving relationships. But if it's not treated, the relationship will not last. Okay. Another question to ask is simply, was your relationship good before the betrayal? Before you found out about this event, whatever it is, would you have said your relationship was healthy, rewarding? Did you, relationships are there to improve our lives. They're not there to make life one long, horrible slog. If this relationship was not healthy and rewarding before the betrayal, then Dr. Cole's advice, and I agree with him, is look, it's gonna be, it's a lot of work to overcome an intimate betrayal. It is a ton of work. Many people don't recover from intimate betrayals with their parents, with their siblings, with their best friends. This is gonna be a ton of work. Are you gonna do the work? Probably not. Probably not even advisable if the relationship wasn't healthy and rewarding even before you found out about the betrayal. So you need to ask yourself that question. And finally, do you have a shared vision for your relationship? In intimate partnerships, you need to have goals and values that align. I've talked about that in my most recent webinar for Austin Community College on asking the hard questions so that you start a relationship and find out early on whether this relationship can even work. A lot of people enter relationships that are not going to be workable because they have deal breakers there. It's like having a huge hole in the hull of a, an actual ship when you set out that you never breach. And uh, some, some of these deals would be like, look, you either have or do not have children. This isn't a thing where you can kind of somewhat have a child. It, this is one of those things where you need, need to have uh, matched goals and values. You either do or do not have an open sexual relationship. These are areas where there's, there's not a gray area here. So um, you have to ask yourself, do we have enough alignment that this is even gonna work out?
Okay, if you decide you're gonna stay after all these questions you've answered and you've realized, yeah, you know what? I'm gonna do the hard work of recovery. The purpose of today's talk is not to go into all the details of how to stay in these relationships, but I'm gonna give you, um, because I know some of you are continuing to stick with this webinar because you have been betrayed, are being betrayed, you're wondering what to do. I really strongly advise you to get the books Broken Trust and Not Just Friends that I've mentioned already. If you are the betrayed partner, uh, I want to I want to emphasize this because a lot of people go into therapy and I really advise you to go into therapy. But the deal is a lot of therapists try to do therapy with the couple without allowing the betrayed partner to get all the details that they need. Betrayed partners usually need a lot of details. And that's any kind of betrayal. It could be financial betrayal. It could be um, an emotional affair. It could be a physical affair. It could be the guy whose partner was looking for jobs all over the country while he thought that they were a committed couple. Whatever the betrayal is, the betrayed partner normally needs details. And the reason the betrayed partner needs these is because they thought everything was perking along just fine, but it wasn't. They need to reintegrate their, their view of reality. And they can't do that without details. So for example, most therapists, it turns out, studies show, most therapists don't know this. They think, oh no, we need to just move straight on to recovery. This is part of recovery. If you have a therapist helping the two of you through a betrayal, you need to tell the therapist, I need to have all the details that I want. No more details than what I want. If I say I don't want a detail, then don't give it to me. But I need to have every gory detail given to me accurately by my partner to the extent that I ask for it. Otherwise, I feel like I don't, I feel crazy. I feel like I don't have a read on reality and I can't recover from it. And that's absolutely true. So the betrayed partner needs to get every detail that they want. They might say, well, when you said we could buy a new home and you knew you had spent all our money, what was going through your mind? Or did you already knew, know that you had lost all our money at the time that we had that conversation about buying a new home? Again, the betrayed person is gonna need all the details that he or she wants. The betrayed partner um, also needs to, to state their perspective without blame. Meaning, as tempting as it is to emotionally, uh, to vent emotionally, that's not going to help your relationship. The books I'm suggesting will both make that point. Any therapist worth their salt will make that point. That what we need to do, somebody's got their mic on, I can hear what's going on in the background. Um, what we need to do as the betrayed party is to very simply state our perspective. For example, I thought that you were taking care of our finances and that I could trust you to protect us financially and that's not what happened. That's a simple way. Or I thought that our relationship was one where we both assumed that the other person would be sexually faithful and you had sex with someone else. Or I thought that our relationship was one where we assumed that we would not share secrets that we told each other with anyone else, but you told my mom. Notice again, lots of different forms of betrayal, not just sexual. So state your perspective without blame. If you say it with blame, it's there's no point in staying unless you're going to recover from the betrayal. And this is the first step of recovering is you have to state your perspective simply and without blame. Now, the betrayer also has a role. The betrayer, first of all, cannot deny, um, defend themselves, apologize, make any promises right at first. They have to simply listen and validate the betrayed partner's perspective. For example, the betrayed partner says, my understanding was that both of us understood 
when we have a really intense personal discussion, we don't talk to anyone else about that, but you told your mother everything. The betrayer has to say, um, you're really upset that I told my mother that uh, you have erectile dysfunction. And um, you know, you're right to be upset about that. I can see that you would feel really um, violated by my indiscretion. The betrayer is going to be very tempted to say, here's the reason I told her, um, I'll ne or I'm really sorry and I'll never do it again. You can't jump to those phases of uh, explaining your perspective, apologizing or making promises yet. That's for later. That's why I want you to read these books. It will lead you through the entire process. It's a process that you can work through with a therapist. I encourage you to work the process through with a therapist, but the very first step will involve not rushing to the things that all of us have a knee jerk reaction to rush to, defending ourselves, apologizing and making promises about it not happening again. Um, if you stay, you'll need to come up with a plan together for this not to happen again. Again, look, betrayal happens once, you can work through that. Betrayal happens more often, probably not gonna work. You need to come up with a joint plan for how this is not gonna happen again. And the betrayer needs to live transparently for as long as it takes. I work with couples as well as individuals. I'm not a therapist. I'm a relationship coach who uses science instead of opinion to guide people. And will tell you a lot of times the perspective of the betrayer is, look, I, I told this person, I told my partner, I'm not gonna do it again, whatever it is. And they should just believe me. No, that's not how this works. Your partner is not just going to believe you. Your partner went through life naively believing before that there was no betrayal. They cannot be expected to take up that mantle again. You as the betrayer, if this is going to work, are going to have a long period of transparency, full transparency, whatever that means. You don't get to define what that looks like either. The betrayed partner define what's, defines what that looks like. Your job is to earn trust. The betrayed partner's job is to be open to you earning it without flogging you with it. But you have a job to earn it. It will not be given freely again. That's just the reality that you've created. Okay, so if the relationship ends, you're going to go through a period of feeling brokenhearted. And I've done an entire webinar on that. And I want you to look at that webinar because I go into a lot of really important details about how to take care of yourself emotionally. Here, I'm going to try to go into some different details. First of all, if the relationship is really over, if you can, and not everybody can, quit the relationship cold turkey. In the earlier grief webinar, I go into the details of why they amount to drug addiction. We are, our attachment to other people, including family members we're really close to. Let's say that you have a parent who violates your trust over and over and over. It's a pattern you've realized through the webinar today that this relationship doesn't make sense to maintain. And, but it's your parent. There are parental relationships that are so toxic that it makes sense to quit them cold turkey if you can. But you know what? You can't always. Sometimes you have to set really high boundaries around the amount of contact you're going to have. If you have to do it that way, I want you to look at the webinar I gave on forgiveness, because in that webinar, I do a lot of discussion about boundaries where if your forgiveness is going to include repeated interactions with the person who betrayed you, you're going to have to have some boundaries. So if possible, 
cut it off cold turkey with whoever this is if you've decided that the relationship is not going to be one that is rewarding enough for you to continue or trustworthy enough for you to continue. On the other hand, if you are going to need to continue the relationship for some reason, say you have a parent with a chronic condition and um, they've developed dementia and you know, you've realized, look, I'm never gonna have the relationship with them that I needed. On the other hand, I'm the only child. There's not enough money to deal with this. I'm not willing to throw my parent to the tender mercies of social services because I couldn't live with myself if I did. Then you're gonna have to create some barriers. And I encourage you to watch the forgiveness webinar and uh, go through that process that I talk about there. Um, keep, if you have required interactions, stay as detached as you can. Let's say that the person that uh, you've decided to end a relationship with is your spouse, but you have kids, you're going to have to deal with this ex-spouse of yours. That's your reality. In that case, um, there's a, a book that I encourage you to get if that's your case called Mom's House, Dad's House. And it talks about emotionally unhooking from this former partner who you now have to do the business of raising your children together with and treat it like a business-like relationship. In a business-like relationship, if somebody insulted you, you would not scream at them or start crying. You might say, I'm gonna have to leave this meeting until both of us can behave more reasonably. But if you view this as a business and that you're, your interactions with this person are going to have to be detached from here on out, then this is going to go better for you. It's going to help you grieve the end of this relationship better than if you continue to be emotionally hooked. Look, the beauty of ending a relationship is recovering emotionally. If you end this relationship, but you keep getting pulled back in, you're not recovering. So what we're really talking about is, is grief recovery here, and you're going to have to be detached. Um, I, I'll give you some more examples as we go along. So let's say that the relationship doesn't end. So there's going to be some grief after betrayal, even if the relationship continues. First of all, you need to find someone safe to tell your stories of shame and grief. A lot of times the betrayer, the reason they do what they do is because they feel deeply ashamed. Whatever the reason for their betrayal, a lot of times they were trying to avoid conflict. They were trying to avoid um, stories that they felt extremely ashamed about. It's time to clean house. If you want your relationship to be even closer than before, you're going to have to talk about what you're ashamed of. I recommend a really good therapist or if you can trust your partner, your partner. Um, but tell somebody who's safe your stories. Find somebody that you can talk to about your grief who makes you feel better rather than worse about it. Because even if you stay, there's going to be grief. Let's say that um, this isn't a romantic partnership. This is a parent who's betrayed you. <clears throat> If your parent has betrayed you, you need to find someone who will listen to you talk about how much that hurts without making it even worse. And I will tell you a lot of times, other family members are just going to make it worse. That's why therapists are so helpful. If you tell a friend, make sure it's a friend who is, yeah, um, Layla has posted um, links to the previous grief webinar and the previous forgiveness webinar for your convenience so that you don't have to Look, the, find those links later. Um, if you're going to tell someone who's a friend, make sure it's a friend who's not going to carry the tale back to whoever it is that you're talking about. It needs to be someone who's also not going to make your relationship harder with this person by giving you unsolicited advice about how you should just leave. When you're going through this grief, if you've decided to stay or if you've decided that you don't know whether to stay yet, you need to have somebody that you can talk to who is not going to give you advice right now unless you ask for it. Also, take as much time as you need to feel all your emotions. 
there, there's not, a lot of times we rush people through their grief. I talked in the grief seminar about um, some normal grief reactions, denial, anger, bargaining, defensiveness, um, acceptance, ultimately. There's not a time horizon on that necessarily. So make sure that whoever you're talking to, that you tell someone who's not going to say, aren't you over that yet? And that you don't say that to yourself. Give yourself time. Work with a therapist who will give you that time. Work with, if you've got the resources, work with a coach who will give you that time. Um, I think therapists are better suited to this though, frankly. Um, that's their, their job. The work of a coach is much more directive. They're there to give you advice. Uh, forgive, but don't forget. What I mean by that is it's naive to think that somebody who's hurt you once is unlikely to ever hurt you the same way again. You need to co-create a plan for it not to happen again, but odds are that it might. So let go of your anger and your bitterness, but discern what, whatever boundaries you need to to protect your heart while you see whether this person can be trusted again. And again, that's in the forgiveness webinar. And finally, if, if you decide to um, leave a love relationship, when, uh, when I talked about the previous grief, in the previous grief webinar, I talk about how people will give you a lot of advice about um, your broken heart and how you, you need to you know, get a dog or go to religious services more often or do more volunteer work or meditate. You know, and all those are great suggestions, but research shows that they actually, in the case of love relationships, they don't really help adults fully reintegrate and feel solid about their place in the world after. The only thing in a 20 year long study by Mavis Hetherington and colleagues, uh, the Virginia Longitudinal Study, the only thing that helped divorcing couples and divorced couples reintegrate and feel whole in their lives again after divorce was finding a healthy love relationship. Adults really need that. And uh, we treat it like it's just icing on the cake. For most people, it's the cake. In fact, for most people, the, the, the meal is kind of poisoned without a healthy adult relationship. Um, the ad adults who remain alone have uh, the same odds of death every year, most of the time, um, as somebody who's got a pack a day smoking habit. It's, it's not a neutral decision. So, um, you know, again, I'm not trying to single shame here. If you want to be single the rest of your life, that's fine. But I am telling you that empirically, people who find love again tend to feel a lot better about themselves, their place in the world, and tend to be much healthier physically as well. So uh, Riley says, I feel like I teeter back and forth between the different phases of grief. Is that normal? Yes, absolutely, it's normal. It's actually one of the big um, criticisms of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's grief model of um, denial, anger, bargaining, um, defense, denial, anger, bargaining, uh, defensive, not defensiveness, deny, deny, I can't remember now, depression and um, acceptance. Um, that people do go back and forth. It's not discrete. It's not like you move through all five stages in order. And some people skip stages and some people repeat stages several times. And some people don't go through all of them. Some people um, go through denial. Denial is almost a universal uh, that people have a hard time rectifying when, they, when you've been betrayed. It's usually really difficult to, to align what happened with what you thought was happening. That's why denial happens a lot. Um, so denial is almost always part of the picture, but some people don't go through um, being depressed. Some people don't go through bargaining. And some people sadly never reach acceptance. And that's what Hetherington found was in romantic relationships uh, where there was enough betrayal that people actually divorced. People didn't tend to reintegrate and, and feel whole and happy again, unless they, um, they didn't find acceptance in other words, unless they found love again. Okay, this comes to helping others grieve. When we, um, 
there, there are some kinds of grief that, that cultures around the world acknowledge. And there are other forms of grief that tend to be silent. They're not only not culturally recognized, but if you admitted that this was the kind of grief you were going through, um, people would actually blame you and shame, and shame you and uh, they would not help you grieve. They would make it a lot worse. So there are a lot of examples of this. And so I wanna talk about helping people grieve when it's not a recognized loss. A recognized loss would be death of a spouse. Everybody is going to feel sad and sorry for you when your spouse dies. Everybody's gonna be sorry for you. Um, if a child dies, everyone's gonna be sorry for you. Even a sociopath might have a twinge at that one. There are cultural, there, there's mourning. Mourning is not the same thing as grief. Mourning is the way a culture expresses grief. So in some cultures, when a family member dies, you cover all the mirrors in the house for a period of a set number of weeks. And you only eat certain kinds of foods and you're expected to engage in certain behaviors during that period of time. And those are culturally recognized griefs. Your culture helps you, actively helps you overcome those. But with hidden grief, there's no cultural recognition. In fact, cultures might um, punish you if they knew about this grief. For example, let's say that your affair partner died. Well, good luck having your culture uh, circle the wagons and help you grieve the death of an affair partner. Another uh, loss that's not culturally recognized and, and um, I think it's a real shame is, uh, in fact, I asked, I have a friend who's an expert in death and dying. Um, her name is Martha uh, Atkinson and uh, Dr. Atkinson, um, Atkins, Martha Atkins. Dr. Atkins, uh, her whole thing is helping families and dying individuals go through the grief process proactively as it's happening and also um, helping them understand that process. And um, I, I wrote to her and I said, you know, I'm encountering something quite a bit in my own practice that I, I'm not finding any answers to this, which is how do we help people grieve when their former spouse dies? In other words, they're not with them anymore. They may be remarried now, but their, their ex dies. How do we help them? And she said, you know, um, there's not a cultural tradition around that. Um, something like one in five women age 60 and up who has children. So of the women age 60 and up who have children, one in five of them have at least one of those children who won't talk to her. Good luck getting culture to really empathize with you if your children don't speak to you. But it's a profound grief. To lose someone who is still living is a profound grief. Um, so there's, there's the losses that we've been talking about, grieving the loss of long-term relationship due to betrayal. And you know, culture really doesn't recognize that either. It's not like we have formal rituals around your spouse cheated on you and here's how we're going to help you through that grief. Or you thought you were gonna get engaged and this person left you at the altar. You know, I've, I've worked with a number of people that happened to and unfortunately, not everybody was very compassionate about that. Sometimes the person who got left at the altar is the butt of the joke. So there aren't any formal rituals here. There's not any cultural recognition of how to help people in this situation. And what happens consequently is that you may be thinking, you probably are thinking about your own circumstances where you have felt grief in your life because we act like the only grief that's legit is the death of somebody. And that's not true. There are many forms of death 
uh, uh, in our lives that aren't actually death. There are friendships that stop being friendships. There are careers that you thought you would have that you won't. There are physical, um, somebody will suddenly have a disability that makes it where they couldn't pursue the career that they've spent years and years trying to get into. Lots of losses happen in life where there's absolutely no cultural uh, support or formal ritual to help people get through it. And the people who are bereaved, they are bereaved. That's something we normally, that's a term we normally only reserve for widows and people whose children have died. But these, these people are bereaved too, and they feel isolated and they feel unacknowledged. And unfortunately, they often feel even worse than that. They feel singled out for um, snide comments and rude treatment and, um, and cruel treatment, being the butt of jokes. How could this have happened to you? No, I'm thinking right now, have any of you watched the Netflix special on the Tinder swindler? Have any of you seen that? There's, there's a guy who made a career out of, I watched it of course, given that I use social science to help people find and keep a love relationship. And a lot of my clients are dating online. So you can bet I watched it. It's, it's a documentary about this guy, he's a real guy. His, when I first started watching, I thought, oh, I wonder which actor agreed to play him in this. No, nobody's playing him, this is him. This guy uh, basically had a Ponzi scheme with women where he would sweet talk women, get them to have sex with him or befriend him. And then he would, uh, he would wine and dine them. And then he would say, oh, you know, money's a little tight right now and I'm being pursued by the mafia or whatever. And I need money from you. And these women would say, oh, you know, because he's taken them to, you know, the Ritz Carlton for tea. He's taken them to Switzerland on vacation. They believe he's rich and that his resources are just tied up right now, but that he'll have money again. So they help him. And he impoverished untold numbers of women in this Ponzi scheme where he would get he would get one woman basically to give him the funds that he was using. To, swin to set another woman up to be swindled. And he did this, and he actually went to jail over this, but only for a few months, and now he's out doing the same exact thing. He's doing the same thing. He's on social media. You can see him doing it, and it's still happening. Okay, first of all, I wanna let you know, that's not normally how online dating goes. Second of all, I wanna let you know, there are a lot of things you can do to keep that from being you. I do encourage you to read my books before you go out there. I really do. This is all based on science. If you're going to date, it's the only start to finish dating advice book that's based on science and not something else. That said, the women who were swindled this way, who are still paying bills years and years later over this guy who swindled them, the normal reaction that they have experienced is people insulting them. I promise you, given what this guy has done, the vast majority of women would get swindled. They would. It's not these women's fault that it happened. It's, bl it's victim blaming. But we do a lot of that. So if you're gonna help others to grieve, there are certain steps you can take to not make it worse. Because what we do when a, a, a loss is not culturally recognized is normally we make it worse. So. To avoid making it worse, one of the things you can do is simply to allow them to be with you and to be heard without any judgment. Just let them tell you their story. You be the person that they can tell without you telling anybody else, without you judging them. You be the person that they can say, um, you know what? I've been divorced from this guy for 20 years and it's, it's like I'm remembering all the things I love about him and I'm crying every night, I'm hiding in the bathroom. So the guy I'm married to now doesn't hear me because everybody's gonna think that I am, um, that I've lost my mind. Why, why am I grieving like this? You be the person who just lets them talk about it instead of say, yeah, you're a weirdo. Um, Sarah Bowman says con artists are compulsive about, yeah, well, yeah, they're, 
there's and there's nobody who cons like a con. They they're, they are compulsive about it and they're very good at it. Those of us who aren't con artists don't expect that somebody else is a con artist, right? We're not looking to get swindled because we don't swindle people. Okay, another thing you can help people with, let them experience their loss as real without minimizing it. If you're tempted to say anything that starts with at least, or the concept of at least, that's a good time to stop yourself from saying anything further. Um, whatever their loss is, they're experiencing it as a, a real loss. Let's say that you knew somebody who uh, their child was horrible to them. They have an adult child and that adult child has been verbally abusive to their mom and dad. Um, they have, uh, they've made up stories and mom and dad lend them money that the child never repays. Um, they have um, tried to get in between the parent's relationship with the other children. They're just, you know, this, this son or daughter is just a really difficult person. And then on top of it all, this son or daughter abandons the parents. I used to be a gerontologist before I did this. And I saw this happen. And people would say, you know, you're really better off without that kid. Or at least your other children still talk to you. All of this is minimizing it. Parents love their children usually without condition. So, you know, saying your kid, yeah, your kid's a turkey, you're better off without them. That's not actually helpful. In fact, it's not helpful at any time to minimize somebody else's loss. Okay, uh, Riley says to everyone, I'm going through a breakup of a relationship of six years, friends for 11. That's a really long relationship, 17 years. I thought we were going to get married. My family and friends have listened to me talk about my feelings, but they all give me the same advice. I should just let it go and start dating again. I'm not ready. I feel like they aren't truly listening to me. I feel unsupported through my grief. How do I know if the friendships I have are worth keeping that cannot support me through something like this? Are they being good friends or are these red flags too? Okay, yes, Riley, thank you for sharing that. That's very vulnerable. Um, first of all, I'm extremely sorry that happened. That's traumatizing. It's traumatizing both that you lost this person and the death of, of a lot of dreams I'm sure you had. And it's also traumatizing that the people that you need to circle the wagons and help you have been saying things that are effectively making it worse. Um, how you know they're worth keeping, I would recommend going through the process that we went through at the start of this uh, webinar of, you know, was, was your friendship rewarding before this happened? Um, can, can they hear you if you talk to them about um, not doing it again? Are they able to change their behavior going forward? Or is this going to just be how they treat all the crises in your lives? You know, they say it's in hard times that you find out who your friends are. Um, I will also say the reason that I added this section to this talk today is that it is normative for friends and family to give advice that is unsolicited, unwanted, and unhelpful when we are grieving. It's normative. So if we made the standard my friends aren't worth keeping unless they support me exactly the way I want them to, then we would have no friends. And people just aren't taught this. We do not teach people how to help folks grieve. You know, even with stuff that you would think, surely people would understand the death of a child is sacred and that you can't be giving unsolicited advice and people still do it, even with stuff like that. So I would say, it's not a red flag, it's humanity. It's the way people do things. And social psychology has shown, they've given names to this phenomenon, they've explained why it happens without going into all of that. What I will say is um, show them this, maybe show them this, um, this webinar, there's gonna be a link to it. And tell them, you know, what I really, really need right now is uh, I need you to just listen. I don't even need you to have a reaction. 
at all. I just need you to listen and tell me at the end of all that listening that you really feel bad that this has happened and that you're here for me. That's all I need. Um, Sarah Bowman is saying people feel uncomfortable with other people's grief and that feel the compulsion to fix it to ease their own discomfort. Yes, that's exactly what's happening. Um, also, there's the just world phenomenon, which is um, the tendency to believe that good things happen to good people. So therefore I'm a good person. So good things will happen to me. And if something bad happens to you, you deserved it. That's, that's a, a human tendency. It's been found multiculturally. Uh, it's been found at, at various points in time that this research has been ongoing. And it, it is what it is. And if our standard is we can only be friends with people who don't have any shred of that, then we're not going to have friends. So our alternative is to show them information like this and to say, here's what I really need from you. I know you mean well. I know it's uncomfortable to hear me going through this. I know you, I know even that part of your advice is really well intended. You really want me to find happiness again. You want me to date again. I get that. Really what I need right now is just to be heard and to have you say, I'm so sorry that happened. I'm here for you. Um, another thing that's helpful when we, when others are grieving is to keep the focus on them and their stories instead of turning it back to us and our stories. You know, again, that's human nature to say, yeah, you know, I get it because, I, or I, I know how you feel because this happened to me too. That kind of works if you're in like AA or Al-Anon or a grief group where that's the, the method of dealing with trauma. But with friendships, normally a better path is just listening to them, asking them um, questions if they find it helpful. Like, how, how did you feel when that happened? Um, and if you want to tell a story, ask, say, you know, I've got an experience that might be relevant, but I want to ask you first, is that okay? If you get their buy-in, then it's fine. But most of the time, people just want you to listen to them. Validate their experiences and emotions. So while you're listening, you can say, yeah, that would be really hard. Or um, I bet that felt terrible. Or anyone would feel that way going through what you're going through right now. Uh, one of the things I love about the Gottman's most recent book, Eight Dates, is that it's got a lot of communication strategies that are helpful in any close relationship, um, not just uh, an intimate partnership. And they have specific phrases that people can memorize because again, we're not taught how to do this. Most of us, most of the time, our parents are very uncomfortable with our discomfort. So our parents say things like, stop crying or I'll give you something to cry about, which is, you know, hardly reassuring. Or they'll say things like, um, you know, cheer up, tomorrow will be a better day. It's very rare that, that a parent teaches their child how to grow up to be someone who does these things, which is why I'm teaching it now. Um, keep the timeline open-ended. In other words, uh, Riley, back to what you said, apparently your friends and family feel like you've grieved long enough and that they think you should be out there and be dating again. Um, if you're helping others to grieve, try to understand that people go through grieving at different stages at different time frames, And, you know, much as you might be over it and be kind of done with hearing about it, if you really love this person, try not to let on that you're done hearing about it. Keep the timeline open-ended. If they move through their grief sooner uh, than you would, also accept that. It's, it's interesting. Um, I've had clients who've said about, about grief, about their ex, they've said, um, you know, I was done with my marriage for years before it ended. And then I went out and I was dating and people kept telling me it was too soon for me to be dating. People reintegrate, reorganize and get ready to do things at different rates. So if for example, one of your friends just got divorced and then they're right out there dating again, that might be the right time for them. It's not necessarily a rebound relationship. There's something called, and I talk about this in my earlier grief lecture or webinar, um, anticipatory grieving. Grieving that happens long before the end of something so that when something actually ends, people are pretty much actually done with it. 
Okay, so that is all I had to say today, which was plenty. And if you have any uh, follow up questions, uh, we've got a few minutes where you can ask them. If you don't have any follow up questions, that's fine too. I think Riley has a question. Okay, um, a couple of people. Uh, yes. Uh, Andrea says, is that what happens when someone passes from cancer and it seems they, they've moved on quickly? Yeah, a lot of times, um, oh, this is, this is a really good question. A lot of times when there's their partners and one of them is chronically ill, seriously chronically ill, and the person who's chronically ill, um, person who's chronically ill has passed. Sometimes the partner who is still living moves on quickly. And mm -hmm. the cultural backlash, you know, we do have cultural rituals around um, death of a, a spouse. And one of those rituals is that the bereaved person is supposed to feel sad for a long time after the death. And I will tell you, they do. But a lot of times when there's a chronic condition, they have felt sad for years and years and years and years, and they have moved through the grief process to a very great extent, and they are ready to live again. And it's important to withhold judgment on that basis. And Elizabeth says, thank you. You're very welcome. And Andrea had her hand up. I believe she wanted to say something. Uh, Riley also had her hand up. I'm sorry. Oh, I, yeah, I, meant, I can't see that. So I meant to say Riley. Yeah. Um, I can't see that. So um, yes, so Riley can Riley can ask the question uh, aloud if if they want to or um, or type it out. Either way. Um, I I'll ask it out loud if you're comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. Uh, to kind of go back to what you were saying about being supported by your friends and family, like on one hand, I, you know, I kind of see their point that I should, you know, let things go and not live in that grief, but I don't, I don't understand my own timeline. Like how long is long enough? You know, I don't want to get stuck there. I want to make those moves to heal and be able to, you know, find love again, like you said, but um, I don't also want to enter into anything committed in the future and not be healed. How do you know before you get there, if you've done the work and, and you are healed completely? It's a great question. And I'm sorry, you have a good reason to ask it. Um, there's, there's a phrase I use a lot in my work with clients, which is it's a both and world. You can both be grieving and looking for a partner if that's what you're, if you're open to it. You don't have to be done with grieving in order to be worthy of finding someone else. Uh, we, we tend to tell people that if they're still grieving, the partnership they find will not be worthy. That's not true actually. And empirically, it's not so. Um, that one of the reasons I'm, I'm so into relationship science is that I am so frequently wrong. And, uh, and this is one of the areas where I would have been wrong. I would have thought, oh, if you're grieving, Riley, then anything that you, any partnership that you pursue is going to be doomed or it's just going to be a rebound or something like that. And it's, it's not necessarily so. People can and do move through grief and find a really happy, healthy partnership. And just to be uh, super personal for a minute, I unintentionally did that myself. So, uh, you know, I've had personal experience with the science. Um, I thought I was over the, the ending of a relationship and then something happened after I had fallen in love with my partner but I just fallen in love with him. It was a new relationship. Something happened with that former partner where I was sucked right back into all the feelings that I had had. It really gut punched me. 
And uh, I wound up having to go to therapy over it. And I did not give up my partnership though, because it was a solid relationship. And it was not the fault of that partner or that relationship that I, that I was going through this again. So um, it, it's both and you can recover. And in fact, a lot of people recover better while having a partner. Now that said, um, I trust you to know the point at which you are through the rawest part of your emotion where you really can't give someone a fair shake at all. Most people, when they're grieving the end of a relationship, they go through a period of time where they really can't fathom having another partner. That's not the time to be looking, but it is possible to look if you've been going through this grief for long enough that the reason you're not moving forward with somebody else is you think you shouldn't because you're not totally through with the grief. That's actually a reasonable time to start looking for another partner. Does that help with your question? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. Sure. It's, I wish I could give people a calendar date on this stuff, but I, I can't, I, I don't know what to say. So I have a direct message. Um, let me ask the person asking the direct message. May I address this without um, outing who you are or are you not okay with that? I won't say the details of your question if I have your permission, but I do need to know if I have your permission. Okay, yes, that's fine. Okay, it's, it's a lengthy question, so I'm reading it right now. Just take a moment. Okay, the situation is that um, this person has in some way, and I don't know what way, betrayed their partner and they have children together and uh, this person loves their partner very, very much, but their partner has uh, decided that they can't be together anymore and that they never will be again. Um, they're still spending time together and uh, th which they need to do some of that because they do have children. Um, and they wanna know, um, to further complicating matters, there's some mixed messaging. The former partner is telling this person, you know, I don't wanna be with anybody else. I'm not gonna be with you, but I'm not gonna be with anybody else. I don't want anybody else. Um, and that's a mixed message because it gives hope uh, I, I think the first thing I would do, speaking directly to you now, I would ask point blank, is there any hope of us getting back together? And if the answer is no, I would take the advice that has been given earlier in this, um, earlier in this webinar to keep your communication entirely business-like, only about the children. Watch, um, actually, I'm gonna advise you uh, to get, I would advise you to get other people's books if they existed, but they're just aren't based on science and I, I don't know to what extent they can be trusted. I've got a book called Love Factually for Single Parents and it talks about exactly how to do this. And the book Mom's House, Dad House talks about exactly how to do this, which is, um, uh, to have a business-like relationship with your ex. I know it's hard, but staying in love with somebody who is clear that they do not want to be in a love relationship with you is torture. And it's going to be hard on you. It's going to be hard on your children. It's going to be hard on your former partner. So I would, first of all, uh, encourage you to 
get whatever the truth is, if there is not any way that this person will get back with you, move on. By move on, I mean do the work of grieving. Go back to my first grief webinar and do the work of grieving. Um, going back to your other hand, aspect of the question. Let's assume that your partner says, well, I feel like right now I could never be with you. But the fact of the matter is, if you proved yourself trustworthy, if I knew this wasn't going to happen again, I would be with you again. That's a different scenario. If that's the scenario, then go about what I would advise is go about co-parenting your children. Keep that part business-like. Get the books that I've recommended on recovering from betrayal. If it's not an affair, then get the book Bro Broken Trust and get a therapist to do this book with the two of you. There's a six step, highly effective way of dealing with broken trust that is in this book that if you were to do it with a therapist would show the two of you whether you can make it. And you've got, you know, you've got kids and you really love this person. So it's, you've got many reasons that it makes a lot of sense to do everything possible to repair the breach. Um, make sure, but you know, honestly, the third thing I would say is ask yourself, are you really not going to do it again? Because if you are, you may as well, you may as well move through bereavement right now and, um, and mourn the loss of the love relationship while you continue the par parenting relationship. So I hope that that response was, um, was helpful to you. All right, you're very welcome. So I don't know, how much time have we got left? We are, we are past time, actually. We're a couple of minutes past time. Okay, good, I'm glad. Normally I go past time more than this. So I'll, I'll consider that kind of a win. If anybody wants to reach out to me, you can find me at, uh, you can email me directly at duena at lovesciencemedia.com. You can see information about my books, get uh, free chapters, all that kind of thing at um, lovefactually.co. And um, Riley has one last thing to add. I think one of the hardest things I've learned uh, I must accept is that you can apologize and truly feel remorse for doing wrong in your relationship, but your partner doesn't have to accept the apology or reconcile even if that's what you want. Truer words were never said. Yeah. Yeah, they don't have to accept it. Um, you know, finding out whether they're at all open to it, uh, it's a good starting point. Asking yourself honestly, can I really never do that again? That's, that's important because if you are, you just give it up if you're gonna keep doing it. Um, and uh, then if the person is at all open to reconciliation, closely following these, you know, Tim Cole, what I love about him is nothing in this book is conjecture. It is all based on his many years of work, um, uh, of research, as, as well as work helping clients recover broken from a situation of broken trust. And Ruth has some kind words. Peace to you, Riley. I honor your struggle. Good on you for recognizing your partner's consent matters, even if you wish you could change their mind. Absolutely. Well, thank you, everyone, for participating um, and sharing your stories. And, uh, you know, um, I, I learned something new. Uh, valuable, valuable something's new from all of Duena's seminars, webinars, and uh, your participation joining us is really why we do this. Um, whether you share your stories with us or not, just being here and um, listening, being present is the reason we do all this work. I appreciate everyone for giving us this time and particularly Duena for once again joining us and we hope to see you again. It was delightful. I wanna thank everyone for uh, participating and being so authentic and vulnerable and uh, honoring 
um, honoring me with your time. And I want to thank you, Shireen, for uh, inviting me, you and Layla for inviting me. It's been great. We'll see you all again. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Bye.